Okay, so it looks like we're all ready to go now. Hi everyone, real glad to have you with us all today. My name is Jennifer Blundell. I'm the International Marketing Manager here at Premier Corex and I'll be your host today. So I will just run you through some details about the session quickly and then we can get started. So welcome, this is our third webinar now in our Formation Damage series and we have Justin Green here, our Formation Damage Consultant today. Um, and Justin will be discussing with us the different types of damaging mechanisms typically seen in injectors, what injection water can do to the reservoir and how these issues can be examined in studies. So we hope you can take away as much as you can from our session. So please feel free to interact with us, participate. And of course, feel free to ask Justin as many questions as you might have throughout. So Justin will be able to see your questions pop up as you enter them into the Q&A that you should see in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a chat function as well, but if you do have a specific question for Justin, who would like him to answer for you during the session, it's best just to use this Q&A and he'll be able to see them pop up in there and answer them for you. So we'll aim for the session to last around 45 minutes. Any questions that can be answered easily, Justin will stop every so often to answer these for you. Any questions that might need a bit of a fuller answer or consideration, we may leave these until the end, but we can go back to them. And we'll also factor in some further time at the end for your questions as well. So thank you everyone for coming and I'll now pass you over to Justin, our presenter today, and he's going to just give you a brief introduction and then he'll get us started. Okay, thanks Jennifer and hello everyone. Thanks from me for coming to the latest in our uh, Formation Damage series of webinars. I've done this every time, but I'll just do it again quickly. My name is Justin Green. I work within the Formation Damage team here at Premier Corex. Uh, just quickly, in case any of you are not familiar with Premier Corex, we used to be known as Corex. Um, we've been doing Formation Damage, Core Analysis, Fluid Analysis for over 30 years and under the name Corex. In the last handful of years, we've become part of the Premier Oilfield Group, who are based out of the United States of America. Uh, our head office is in Houston with other labs in USA. Premier Corex uh, have expertise still in conventional reservoirs and Premier Oilfield Group has given us more expertise in unconventional reservoirs. Corex, we have uh, our main lab here in Aberdeen where I'm talking to you from. Uh, and we also have facilities in, big facility in Cairo, a uh, new facility in the UAE in Abu Dhabi, uh, another new facility in Kuwait and then last year we opened up a lab in uh, Noida uh, just on the outside of Delhi in India. So that's who we are and today's subject is water injection. So I'd like to concentrate on some of the potential damaging mechanisms today. Water injection is a big subject so we could be any of the subject any of the topics I talk about today could probably be a webinar of their own. So what I'm going to do is like think about some of the key topics and hopefully illustrate with some pictures and some data, show you the kind of damaging mechanisms, damaging issues that we've seen in the past, and then talk a little bit about how we look at them. What we're probably not going to do today is dive into each individual one and look at the individual results and individual solutions that we saw. These might be uh, done in future. But when we think about water injection reservoir issues, now I'm talking with a formation damage hat on here. And by formation damage, I've said this in early, earlier webinars, I mean anything that we do from the first second of drilling to the last drop of injection, in this case, or production, to change the reservoir's behavior. And so I'm thinking about how we could impact on injectivity here. And so the, I've put some of the key ones up here. I'm going to look at most of these today, but not all of them, actually. So first thing we have to do with water injectors is drill them. So we have to make sure we drill them and complete them properly. And we have to try and avoid damage while drilling and completing. But then is there any additional complication of being an injector that we have to factor in damage for? So I'll talk about that. The most obvious one in terms of injection is, does my water damage my reservoir through compatibility issues? We'll definitely be looking at that. Depending on where the water comes from, if it's seawater, we're definitely going to have to filter it. What filtration is required? What is damaging my reservoir in particular? Can I get away with quite coarse filters or do I need fine filters? We'll look at that as well. Mixing of source waters, you know, depend, this depends on where, where in the world, where our field is situated. 
but we may not be able to just inject a single water into the reservoir. We may have to do produce water reinjection, for example, cutting that in in different con different mixes, different ratios. It, it, with seasonal variations, we may have to use water from different sources and different mixes. Does that cause a problem chemically and compatibility wise? That kind of touches on this next one, seasonal water variations. You know, in the North Sea, we're not going to see so much of that. But if we think of somewhere like, I know we've done a lot of water injection work in Iraq. And we know that when we're looking at river waters, for example, we might see quite significant differences in the chemistry, the solids, the filtration required in the water as the seasons go on. Summer versus wet season may be totally different. Then last up, one I'm not really going to talk about today, but we have to consider, I'll touch upon it briefly, is thermal fracturing. Because I'm going to concentrate quite a bit on near well bore issues, matrix injection issues. Um, and a lot of people say, well, we're going to thermally fracture a reservoir. We can hopefully bypass this damage. We don't really need to consider it. One point I'd like to make is that with thermal fracturing, we need some injectivity. So we want to minimize the damage, maximize injection rate to maximize the impact of, of thermal fracturing. When the thermal fractures are, or are modeled, there is some the 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 impact or the efficiency of the fracturing depends on the injectivity rate. So I'm not really going to talk about thermal fracturing today, but we will touch upon it in a, in a couple of the slides. So that's that's the, the 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 key things that I think we we should be thinking about in terms of water injection reservoir issues. And then the main question I said and the or the title of the presentation is do we see different or additional damage in injectors now this is a very um, busy graph don't worry i'm not going to be going diving into the data we will come back to this later this is a real set of data from a study but what i've highlighted here is red is the oh i've got the colors wrong uh, red is the producers and blue is the injectors in this study my, my key is wrong at the bottom here so the red lines are producers so what we have here is We've measured the baseline permeability of the reservoir. We've built up a mud cake, and then we've produced at various rates through the reservoir. And you can see permeability is increasing with production. We're seeing a range in results. And then there's a gap here because this is the injection part. But at the end of the production test, they're kind of following the same trend, a fairly expected trend for producers. The blue, which is the injectors, are all over the place. So with this exactly the same field, exactly the same conditions, the ones up here, the blue lines up here, are injectors that have had backflow before before injection started. The ones where the lines start here are where injection was was started immediately with no backflow, and the results are all over the place. We were going to look at some of this data in detail later on, but what this kind of shows straight away, this study was great for illustrating that because we looked at producers, injectors with backflow, injectors without backflow, is that injectors things can get complicated fast from cleanup, from are we re-injecting solids or polymer into the reservoir? So my answer is, do we see different and additional damage in injectors? No surprise, yes. So let's look at where that can come from and what causes that and how we can identify that. That's what we're gonna to do today, how we can identify it. We're not necessarily gonna look at all the solutions today because as for example, scaling is a, a webinar of its own. So sometimes I've been putting up in these webinars, why, why should we care about this? And I, I've been coming at it from a best practice viewpoint of getting our job right, and also a financial viewpoint of you know production wells. We need the best production, losing 10% production has a, a firm impact on the, on the finances of the reservoir. For the injector, maybe let's look at it from a technical viewpoint. I still think that the, well, let's do the best job possible. And the, better the injectivity rate, the better financial and value results there'll be, which comes in with the minimum injection rates here, but that's also a technical thing. So maybe for today's webinar, let's think about some of the technical reasons why we might need to pay special attention to water injectors. So first up, depending on our, our field development plan, we might not have unlimited water injectors for pressure support or production support. We may need minimum injection rates. Damage might not be tolerable beyond a certain level. That also ties into what I mentioned about fracturing and thermal fracturing. That might need certain rates to fracture as expected to give us this, the fracture area or the fractures that we need. Ejector wells, we may or may not be able to flow back, produce before we're injecting or at any point in the process. So that's where damage becomes important, where event, uh, that also ties into intervention being difficult sometimes. If we kind of rule out some of the traditional ways of removing damage, which, for example, for drilling, 
and completion damage in open hole producing is tends to be one of the if not the dominant way to try and remove the damage in the near well box if we can't do that then we need to think about is is it going to become a problem and if it is how do we fix that the water that we use so I guess when i say what goes into the well the waters for injection may be controlled by the available water sources so it's not like we can just say what is my reservoir made of what is most compatible with it we have to think about what am i actually being forced to put into it and is it causing damage to the reservoir and if it is can i work around that because we may have no choice on what goes into the reservoir and then produce water injection ties into that we may be having to put produce water back into the reservoir we may not be able to dispose of that in that case what happens when i mix it with my injection water is it the same formation water that's already in the reservoir what happens so these are these are some of the things that are different from producers which we need to bear in mind that are going to be important for us in terms of damage all of them boil down to two subjects i would say we want to if we can if these are potential concerns we want to think about minimizing drilling and completion damage and we want to try and minimize injection water damage so i'll talk about some of the some of these uh, mechanisms in, in a bit more detail so for thinking about these potential injection water issues what are the key sensitivities we can see in injectors and by sensitivities i mean the reservoir talking about formation damage how could our reservoirs be sensitive to what we do to them during injector drilling completion and injection so here's here's some of the i think not only topics but i think main topics is fair to say i think that anyone who's dealt with injectors will have seen some of these topics and i think these are these are the key ones so drilling and completion damage if that damage doesn't clean up during the production period if it's possible or if it's not doesn't clean up during injection that could have a significant impact on injection compatibility so injection water or waters mixed if they if they mix and cause incompatibility with the formation rock or the formation fluids we have compatibility issues solids and oil and injection water so how what is the solids loading and what is the size of it and does that impact on my reservoir injection rate this is one that sometimes gets put to the side a little bit injection rate is what impact is actually physically injecting have on the on the reservoir um, and I'll talk about that and I've got a slide to, sh to show on that one afterwards as well um, and then souring and bacterial activity another one that tends to get um, pushed to the side and not thought about you know we think of souring as a producer issue a facilities a handling issue but I'm going to show a couple of pictures on how it can become an issue in injectors as well as in a classic damage mechanism so that's some of the sensitivities that I think we consider being some of the main ones and then if we're trying to extrapolate that in into a formation damage context and I keep saying mechanisms mechanisms what are the sort of results we could see from these sensitivities so we first up if we think about the drilling completion damage dead simple drilling and completion fluids blocking pores and stopping or inhibiting injection that's a nice easy one to consider drilling and completion it's sometimes difficult to fix but it's easy to understand in the compatibility area uh, i think we could think about a few things we can think about these these three maybe even four of them are all sort of compatibility related ones so scaling is the one that we we think of so it's by scaling i mean two brines mixing and due to the the chemistry and the ions that are present um, an incompatibility arising and causing a precipitate to develop which can happen outside the reservoir inside the reservoir shallow deep and it can be from chemical compatibility it can be from pressure changes from temperature changes so if we cool for example if we cool the reservoir during injection we can cause scale to, to precipitate in the reservoir without there being a direct incompatibility so scaling is a key one in injection reservoirs um, now we if we're thinking about injecting into water leg we don't have to really think about this but there's plenty of injection into oil leg so if we inject water into oil leg and it's for example cool water into a hot oil leg then we can have waxing and that's a that could start to block up pores we can have emulsion if uh, if regardless of the temperature we can have an emulsion of the injection water with the oil so for injecting into oil leg that adds an extra level of, of complication to it 
So incompatibility can cause clay swelling. So if we think about um, smexite clay, that can be quite sensitive to lower salinities. So when we think about uh, introducing an injection water that's lower salinity than the native brine, we could potentially have swelling if we have significant amounts of this type of clay. We can also see fines mobilization um, caused by chemistry. I've got a slide to talk about that, so I'll look a bit about that later. And then variation in water mix, changing compatibility. So as I said, what happens if we change the mix? Does it change, change the results? And I'm going to show you some real test data to show how that can happen and does happen. And then when we think about filtration, solids, oil and the water blocking pores, that's obvious as well. The rock becomes a filter. So if the rock is filtering out the solids or the oil rather than the filters doing it, then we're transferring the damage from the filter, which is replaceable to the rock, which we can't necessarily fix after it's happened. And then finally, with the souring one is biopolymer and cells blocking pores. So again, almost forgetting about the souring because it might not be if it's in water like we may not have oil there to sour, but we might have the right ingredients for bacteria to grow and block pores. So these are some of the key damaging mechanisms. As I said, I'm not trying to be exhaustive today. I'm trying to pick some of the main ones, the ones that are most commonly seen, the ones that are relatively easy to think about. And how do we look at these? So I'm going to, I'm going to now talk about the break down some of these mechanisms and look at some of the data. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of core flood test data. I'm going to show you some other test types as well, but when we're talking about core flood test data, I thought I would show those who are not familiar with core flooding setups what our water injection facility looks like, because this is a little bit um, different from a typical formation damage test facility, which look at the right hand side here. This is what people who have seen a formation damage lab have maybe seen this kind of setup for an oven, which you'd have a sample, a core sample loaded in reservoir conditions with pressure vessels for oil and gas and flow. And you can simulate reservoir sequences, drilling, completion, injection, look at solids at reservoir conditions. So this is the, the sort of state of the art. The best thing to do for, for understanding injector any well is to try and simulate it in the lab at reservoir conditions. Now injection wells, when we're looking at slightly more complex issues, it gets a bit more difficult to do it. So I'm just showing you the picture here of our injection setup we've designed. And you can see anyone who sees this sort of lab stuff is familiar with seeing pumps attached to rigs. You can see our injection setup has actually got six individual pumps here that we can use. So that allows, allows mixing of various different ratios of fluids. It allows us to be quite precise in controlling what the mixtures are when we're looking at things like mixing ratios and, and scaling and things like that. What you can't see, there's this line going through the roof here. This goes up to an upstairs. It's a two-story facility actually, where we actually have a system that allows us to mix solids and uh, oil or hydrophobic and hydrophilic particles and keep them suspended in fluid and then injected straight into the reservoir. Because as usual with formation damage, which again, we're not gonna go into today, it's very easy to have a go at doing these kind of tests. It's very difficult to do them properly. So when I'm talking about core flooding, which will be in some of the slides, think about this. This is the kind of kit it's being done on, sort of high spec, high pressure, high temperature, reservoir conditions, core flooding equipment, simulators. So first up, let's talk about drilling completion of injectors just for a handful of slides. I'm back to this data set here that I showed you in, in one of the first slides. So red is producers, blue is injectors. And you can see this is, a, as I said, a real study, North Sea, uh, quite a significant development. You can see there's a bunch of samples referenced up here. It's quite a, a messy graph. So let me break out a few things from it. So first up, let me show you the producers. So I've broken that out separately now. So producers, as I said at the start, these are nice and easy to understand. You know, we can ignore the gap here because these lines join up more or less directly because there's no injection. So we have no points in there. As I said, we've measured a baseline permeability and then we've built up mud cake. There was a displacement fluid in this sequence as well. There was a drilling and completion sequence. I think this had, might've had standalone screens in it, uh, hardware in it. Um, but we then did that and then we produced, you can see we produced at different rates through the reservoir and measured the permeability after each. And this line here is the baseline original permeability. The zero is if we've lost 100% of the permeability. And you can see we have a range of results. We have, you know, we've lost a good amount of permeability, more than half after the low rate drawdowns. And that's cleaned up as we increased the rate. And it's gone between, you can see, between 40 and 80%, which, you know, these are fairly normal results. Some are good, some are bad. 
easy to understand and as we've taken off the mud cake, th these patterns are easy to understand. This is typical producer graph. So producers in the field behaved exact, not exactly, but behaved as you'd expect in this kind of study. Ejectors, here's all the injector data, much more all over the place. It's like up, down, big drops, little drops. What is going on? So this study had a lot more aims, but let's think about the, the aims that the operator told us they were looking at for the injectors. They needed a high injection rate. They, it was gonna be very difficult. I can't remember if it was impossible, but it was very difficult to do backflow. So they wanted to avoid that. So they were considering treatment rather than backflow. So they were going to do with and without treatment. So they were gonna look at what happened if they tried to inject with just as is, and what happened if they injected with after treatment fluid. So this is a good one to show you because we've got every option here. We've got producer, I've got injector with production, injector with treatment, then injection. So I can compare them all. So again, this is still quite a noisy graph. And what this actually shows this data set is three drilling or three operational sequences, one oil-based mud, and then two different water-based muds. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in on the two water-based muds because they behave differently. And I think it's a good way to illustrate how things can be more complicated and need more think, thinking about than, than we consider for injectors. So the first mud was a sized salt water-based mud. So rather than having barite or calcite in it, this one had um, salt crystals that were sized to the right side. So it's a saturated brine with salt particles in it. And the thought is that as you start to flow water through that, you should start to dissolve the, um, the salt crystals because you're not saturated anymore. So that's thought to be a self or self cleaning mud. So there's two data sets here. You see there's two, so we had two different rock types we were testing here. So these two here, which are uh, 4A and 1I, the red, the diamond shaped ones, these had production. So you can see we start from the back, from the start. So we built up, we did the injection drilling completion sequence, and then we produced it again, these four rates through the reservoir, and then we turned on to injection. And then we carried on injecting and we did things like if there's any external cake, we removed it and we centrifuged it. We won't dive into that detail just now. And then we had a second da data set where we didn't produce, we just after the drilling completion sequence, we went straight on to injection. That's the, these samples 1C and 4I, they went straight onto that just with the treatment fluid. So what did we see here? We saw, we saw that there was a variation between the rock types. So if we look at the back production one, we saw they cleaned up, they weren't terrible, 50 to 70, 80% is not the worst result. You know, that's a fairly acceptable result here. They cleaned up time. When they went on to injection, they dived down a little bit. I think the, the conclusion or the implication there is that the, there was some sort of re-injection of solids into the reservoir, but then as the injection rate increased, it carried on cleaning up and was at least at the level it was before or a bit better. This one was certainly better. And then as we carried on in this one here, you can see we took off the cake and there was very little in increase in permeability. This one, there was a big jump showing that this cake hadn't fully cleaned up. However, the results aren't terrible. With the treatment where we used a treatment fluid prior to bringing on to injection, you can see the same pattern exactly as there, but the results are 30, 40, you know, at 30% versus 70%, 30, 40% lower by not having the backflow in there. So in this particular fluid system and well combination, the treatment fluid was less effective than production. So the aim of the, the client had of the treatment being cleaning up as well as production was not met in this system. So that was an example of the injection adding complication because with no backflow, we would expect a significant reduction in injectivity in this, with this system in this reservoir. I'm not gonna generalize here. This is specific to this rock and these systems tested. And then we've got the carbonate water-based mud. Now I've left the producer on here because this, this shows some interesting stuff. Um, so we've got three scenarios here. We've got these first two samples which are with production. So these point two points here with production, with no treatment. We've got these two samples that start here, which are no production, but with treatment, same as in the previous example. And then I left the producer on just so we can compare the endpoints to each other. I think the first thing to say is the endpoints, they're basically all the same. So what we get to here is a very tight pack. And when we look at breaking it down, so if I ignore the producers now, looking at the with production, we see the same sort of trend. We look at the production cleanup, and it drops off a bit when we start to inject, and then it proves all the way to the end there with as the injection rate increases and as we remove the cakes and set centrifuges and samples. So the end point is pretty much the same. There's levels of damage. These are not necessarily catastrophic levels of damage. So with production, no treatment, we got that result. 
And then with the injectors, initial injectivity at the lower rates was showing higher, high levels of damage. But then it's broadly similar to the points we're seeing here, maybe a bit worse, but it's cleaning up fairly rapidly. And by the time we get to the end of injection, all our samples are in the same area here. And then as soon as the production data kicks in, we're just looking at exactly the same. So in this drilling fluid, the carbonate water-based mud, so it's a calcium carbonate was in the drilling fluid. The production and the treatment gave very similar results. So this was kind of like a good result what the operator were looking for. So within this, well, we tested this two different system or within the field, should I say, we tested these two different systems, sized salt water-based mud, the injection with treatment was worse than the produced produced one, which was suboptimal for their, their aims. Whereas with the carbonate water-based mud, we saw that there were basically similar results with the producer, with an injector, with production, without production. So that was like, this is a good result because it, the options were wider here because we were seeing broadly similar results. So that's just looking at these two sets of results, quite different results. And unfortunately for operators, unfortunately for a lab company, difficult to predict. So we needed some studies to try and pinpoint what the issues might be. I mean, we obviously have electron microscope data, CT scanning data, which I'm not showing today, but there's a lot of thought gone into what caused these differences. We absolutely did see difference with fluids and sequences there. So that's just a little bit on drilling completion. As I said, I, I'm only going to look at, look, not dive very deep into every single one here. So the next one is compatibility. So I'm thinking here about scaling first. So scaling, scaling can be done in a number of ways. So the, the way, if you've ever seen the scaling data, the one that is quite commonly seen as the first step is this at the right hand here, which is called scale prediction or scale prediction modeling, in which you take the chemistries of the fluids you have. So maybe a formation water uh, ion analysis and an injection water ion analysis, and then you mix them in a computer in a simulator that is designed to look at what happens with these and changing conditions and rates and looking at that impact on individual scaling ions. So here we've chosen calcite, calcium carbonate, very common scaling scaling ion. And you can see how on this, this uh, axis here, we have 100% of water one and 0% of water two. And at this end, we have 100% of water two and 0% of water one. So this is the mixing ratios. And you can play with anything, you can play with temperature, pressure, this one is a pH one, look at the pH changing. So what you can see is, for example, here when we, no matter what mixing ratio we have at lower pHs to about between 5.6 and let's say 6, 7 pH, this, there's basically no, this blue is basically flat, there's a slight increase here at the lower end, but let's just say there's little to no scaling risk here. But as the pH increases, what we see is that as we, the higher amount of water one we have here, the higher the risk. So you can see, look at the water two, 100% of the water two, even at the higher pH is no scaling risk really. But very rapidly, as we start to mix in water one to it, we're starting to see a scale risk. So what that shows in a, in a computer is, you know, as I mix my waters, what are my likely risks that I've, I've got there? Once we know that, we can start to think, is there enough of it in the reservoir or in the source water to need to inhibit that? And that's when we look at things like scale inhibitor, dosing waters with scale inhibitor, doing core floods to look at that. But this is just about identifying the mechanisms today. So that's, that's in the computer. The next step from there is usually doing something simple like this image here, doing jar tests, static jar tests, mixing these brines in various ratios and having them at temperature and looking at what happens. And you go from the right hand image here where we have clear waters, no incompatibility to, you know, even with, with our naked eye, we can see that this water at the other end has become discolored yellowish because there's an incompatibility. And we're seeing that increasing as the ratio goes towards this end here. So we're seeing scale develop in the bottle. And that's, that's quite common is scale prediction in the, in the computer do bottle testing. Quite often another thing that's done is called dynamic tube blocking to look at uh, dynamic, uh, looking at mixing two brines in a tube and measuring the differential pressure increase. One thing that's not always done and is really important to consider is what happens in the reservoir because the rock can act as a, a sort of nucleation point for scale as well. So this is a real water injection example. So this is an electron microscope after a study. And we can see they've got a pore here, which is black and grains framework, grain sitting here, and then all over the surface of the grain, this is scale that's developed there. 
So this is seeing what it looks like in a reservoir from a water injection, and that scale starting to develop in a relatively short-term core flood as well. Remember, these core floods are not generally long-term, so that's a relatively significant scaling problem in short term. And as I said, what, when we see these sort of scaling issues, that's when you start to think about, do we need an inhibitor? Do we desulfonate the seawater, for example, if it's barium sulfate that's developing? So that's a thing that's looked at in a whole different genre of testing. I'll talk, touch briefly on it before we conclude. Another compatibility one, I talked about mixing different ratios of water. So this is real data from a field in the Middle East, and I've blanked out this gray thing here is the formation name, so it would give away straight away which field it was, so this is uh, confidential data. But what we were looking at here was mixing different source waters. So we had a, what was called the injection water, and I'm just going to leave it at that. And then sometimes they were being mixing in produced water from a certain formation, and they were looking at what happens with neat injection water and what happens as they start to um, mix in the formation brine. And what this data here shows, we had water like core and then we mixed various ratios through separate samples. These are, these are five separate samples. And then we did, we did it at different rates. You can see the operator wanted to look at realistic injection rates and seeing if it made a difference. We're not gonna bother about diving into that part of it. But the, what I want to illustrate here is this was severely affected. The results in this field were severely affected by the mixture of waters, not necessarily purely the compatibility between the reservoir and the injection water. It was actually the mixture of the three fluids that was causing the issue. As we'd expect when it was 90% the produced water, because the produced water was very similar to the native brine, if not exactly the same, then we were seeing very little change in, you were seeing change in permeability, but not so much. This was the best case, was very little of injection water mixed with the formation or the produced water. But as soon as we started mixing in decent amounts of injection water, the results just dived off. And when we were mixing in small amounts of formation water or produced water into large amounts of injection water, we were 50% difference in permeability results. So that's a severe impact on injectivity by this blend here. So this is where a classic example of where if produced water was going to be re-injected, absolutely had to consider treating that water before it ever saw the reservoir. Because if this happens inside the reservoir, there will be a significant impact on injectivity. That's a great example of mixing and seasonal differences or different timelines where as water sources change can have an impact on the reservoir. And we don't always consider that. Solids and oil removal. So I'm going to show you here, this is a um, core flood study where it's quite simple. We took reservoir cores and we put concentrations and particle size distributions that were thought to be representative of what would come through the filters that they were th thinking of using. And then injecting that into the reservoir, measuring the differential pressure and then measuring the permeability. So we can see here as we inject through the rock fairly quickly, the differential pressure began to rise up in both rocks as two different rock types. There's a difference in shape of the curve. So here, so you can see this one was a bit more gradual. This will be the higher perm, whereas in the lower perm, it just basically straight away, the pressure started shooting up. And you can see the differential pressure is much higher in this lower perm than in, than in the higher perm. However, how did that impact on the permeability? Both of them saw big results. So after we injected the, the solids laden fluid, and it, well, I'm not talking like a mud, we're talking like realistic injection waters here. The permeability of this is this, is this blue block, and we'd, we're, we'd reduce between 65 and almost 80% reduction in permeability just from solids in the injection water. The rock was acting as an extremely effective filter, and it was really diving the permeability down. And what we did was we took it out, and we could see there was a solid scape from the injection water on the formation, and we removed that. And that means I'm talking about a millimeter outside the sample that increased the permeability by 50 odd percent. So there's this, we basically demonstrated the rock athlete acting as a filter here. And then we trimmed off the very near wellbore and saw that the, the permeability came back up nearly to 100%. So in other words, we're reducing the permeability by 60 to 80% by creating a filter cake of solids in the reservoir because the filtration level wasn't appropriate for this rock. So we know what we think a good water is. They knew what they thought a good water was. For this rock, it was a disaster. This is what it looked like in a, in a scan. So this is a technique we use called 3D alteration modeling. And you can see we inject water into the, into the rock. Um, 
with the salts and we look at it before and after this is a kind of this shows us where the change is and all the red area most of the change here is just at this injection phase so that backs up this test data essentially what we did was we <laughs> turned the well bore into a filter which uh, is obviously a very undesirable result because that's very something very difficult to reverse if we can't backflow and we can't treat that and treating solids removal is very tricky and then looking at the good side of it, so you know, I'm showing you what it looks like in a bad case, but then when things are done correctly, when we have a good filtration level for the reservoir, this is comparing a bad result to a good result, very similarly. You can see, look, 7% difference, 4% difference, 3%, this is 10% difference, but that's nowhere near as bad as we saw. And we can see basically no pores blocked here. It's black, it's empty, it's invisible. So this is an example of a good result where the injection water was appropriately filtered. This is a different field, the waters and rocks weren't a million miles geographically away from each other. It showed that small differences in reservoir type and water filtration level can make big differences in the outcome of this. So again, of course, I'm saying this coming from a lab guy, but we see quite subtle differences making big changes in permeability. So injection could be complicated and difficult to predict. And then just a couple more to look at. Finds migration. Um, one thing we think about with the jet, I've put a question there. Question, does clay have to move outside of a pore to cause damage? Because the thinking is in producers, that producers are the ones that we should think about finds migration being a problem because we're coming from a large volume deep in the reservoir to a small volume near the well board. So if we have clays floating around in our production, the con concentration and accumulation can start to block pores. And generally, people might say, well, injectors, we're going from a small volume to a large volume. And also, the injection rate should drop off as we go deeper into the reservoir. So this shouldn't be an issue, because where the injection rate is high enough, the clays will disperse and flow away into a larger volume. And deeper into the reservoir, we shouldn't see clay finds migration. But I want to ask the question, to, is, does clay have to move outside of a pore to cause damage? Because I'd argue, no, it doesn't. And that means we have to be thinking about it in all scenarios because there's two reasons why we could have clay finds migration or two main reasons, let's say. Um, this is a, 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 an electron microscope image in a pore. So I've got a pore throat here. And I've got pore throats here. There's another one here. And we've got grains, quartz grains here. And we've got this kaolinite clay sitting in the pore. You can see right in the line of fire. If we're flowing from here to here or here, we have to flow past this, this clay. So I've kind of got two sort of cartoon graphics on. We've got this red line, which what I'm showing, imagining here is imagine we have to flow past that. These clays are held together by relatively weak forces, static van der Waals forces. So at some rate, we're going to be traveling fast enough and turbulently enough through the pore that we're going to start to overcome the attraction of these clay plates to each other and ping them off. And you can see there's what an individual clay plate looks like, kaolinite plate looks like. This is almost 10 microns across this plate. And you can see it's starting to be not that much smaller than the pore throat there. So a high enough rate. And do we know what that is? That's a question because we don't know what an ind each individual rocket is that is lookable at during core flood testing. So we, injection rate can be an issue, but then physiochemical or chemistry can have an impact as well. And that does not require a higher rate. So kaolinite, for example, which we have here, salinity differences, pH differences, these are things that can cause kaolinite to disperse. So for example, if we, you know, this kaolinite will tend to be saturated in the formation brine. So if it has salinity one, and then we introduce an injection water of salinity two, which is very different, we can cause these to, to, to break apart and uh, flow, inside, flow inside the well bore. If the pH changes, same. And so imagine just flowing at a low rate with a different chemistry, causing some of these plates here to move they might not even get out of this pore they might start to block within an individual pore so i'd like to say that in the areas where there's a high enough rate we can have damage within individual pores rather than moving deeper into the reservoir and we can also have damage at low rates with an incompatible chemistry so i would argue that clay finds migration is still an important thing to think about in injectors don't just rule out and say we're injecting we don't have to worry about it so, so we've got a question from Uger for clay bearing formations. Obviously, fast turbulent flow may cause fire fine to migrate and block the pores. Higher flow rates are also believed to minimize damage. So how should one optimize the flow rates considering these two opposing results? Excellent question, because I'm going to come back with my same old answer I give in the world of formation damage. There are lots of 
rules and ideas we have of how the reservoir could behave. But then the thing, the million billion dollar question is how does my reservoir actually behave? And so if you ask me this question is there's low rates or we could see fine migration at low rates, but we may see it improved at higher rates because it may be dispersed and transported away from the pores and into a larger area. I would say I would want to know how my formation is going to perform. And I would say I would want to get a bit of my reservoir rock and see what happens with formation with the clay finds migration, see if we're in one end or the other or neither. We may have no problem. We may have a problem at low rates. We may have a problem at high rates. So I think that the question you've raised there Ugar, is really relevant. But I'd want to have a look at my rock and see how it performed because, you know, doing a bit of core flooding is there's a cost associated with it. But seeing finds migration damage and deep injection uh, is, a, is something I would consider a, a problem. And I think the last one I wanted to look at just now, and I'm not, again, this is a massive subject, is bacterial damage. So again, we think of souring facilities, handling financial problem with oil, but in injection reservoirs, let's just think about the three things or the three main things, let's say, bacteria need to cause to grow in a reservoir. They need to be in the reservoir. They need something to eat and they need the right conditions to be alive. So with injectors, we can either be bringing bacteria into the reservoir, we can either be bringing the nutrient source, or we can be changing the conditions to do that. So there could be native reservoir that don't have the right food. We, in, we introduce that, for example, with sulfate in seawater. Or if the, res, if the reservoir is too hot for the bacteria to thrive, we can cool it down, which is what I'm showing here. Here we have an injector and a producer. We have a thermal gradient as soon as we start injecting water. In. If the reservoir bacteria are, are sort of in hibernation, if you like here, because it's too hot, but we cool them down in this zone so that they become active, we can suddenly just switch them on by injecting. Likewise, if we introduce the food source from injection water, or we introduce bacteria from topside or in the injection water that thrive in reservoir conditions, that's a way of switching on bacterial activity. And then you say, but this is an injector. It's not, we don't have to worry about the oil. What we do, I think of formation damage is what I think about. And I think of things like cell growth. If we grow bacterial cells, these are cells, these are colonies of bacteria. That have, this is a water leg with oil droplets in it. And the bacteria have grown on the outside of oil droplets. And then once the oil is eaten away, they've died. But this has formed this colony of cells, which is blocked to pore. This is actually blocked to pore here. Biopolymer, which is the other thing associated with bacterial growth, that has blocked pores as well. So we have these cells, these are called ovoid cells, but this kind of smooshy, stuff around it is biopolymers so we've grown bugs imagine if you take a glass of tap water and leave it sitting on the window in sunlight for a week or two you have that film of scum on it the, the sort of that's biopolymer that's what's grown and imagine that in a well at a higher temperature with the nutrient they need that sort of scummy gooey water in your windowsill at room is going to be magnified at reservoir and that's what we're seeing here Another side effect we can see of sulfate reducing bacteria is metal sulfide precipitation. So here we have an SEM image of this sort of submicron level precipitate. And this is blocking pores in this reservoir. So when some, someone says to me, it's an injector, I don't have to worry so much about souring. No, you don't. But you need to think about um, bacterial growth and pore blocking. And that's a mechanism that I think not enough people consider is bacterial damage and in injectors. So just a couple of slides to, to finish off now then. So what, from what we've looked at, here are the things I've picked out from what I've showed you that I think are cons key considerations that we need to think about in injectors that maybe we don't in producers or we can't just copy and paste our producer plans to injectors. So firstly, is there drilling completion damage? Um, is there drilling completion damage? Can we produce it away? If we can't and there is drilling completion damage, do we need to treat that? So I think that's a really key question. What waters will we be injecting? How will they change with time? And does that impact on the, 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 the permeability? Whatever the water is, is it compatible with the reservoir rock and fluids? We know oil is going to be in a producer or gas or, 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 or a condensate. They're going to be compatible. What if the waters aren't? What is a good quality water? I put that in inverted commas because, and I've underlined my, because good quality water from one reservoir is not necessarily going to be good quality for another reservoir. The shape of pores, the size of pores, they have an impact, the tortuosity of pores have an impact on whether solids and oil get trapped within those pores. Is there a sensitivity to injection rate? You know, the question we had and what I tried to raise, 
is higher rate better? Is lower rate better? Is there sensitivity? And then are we promoting bacterial damage? So these are the questions I think we should be thinking about in injectors. And just for my last proper slide, I'd just like to think, just briefly talk through some of, the, some of the ways we examine it. And again, there are many ways, but I just want to talk through some of the key ways. So one thing that's very commonly done is, well, let's look at injection as a whole. Let's just take a sample of injection water, whole water, from the uh, injection plant or from a point in the injection system, pump that through a bit of rock and see what happens. Does it in fact impact the permeability? If it doesn't, we're probably quite happy with the results. If it does, then we do have to think about breaking out individual issues. Finds migration. So that's a relatively easy one to look at. Injection rates, so looking at flow rate dependency, looking at injecting through the rock at various injection rates, seeing what the impact is on permeability and on the rock, and then to look at the impact on chemistry on, on fines migration, you look at brine injection of different chemistries of brine or different salinities of brine, and that typically gets called critical salinity as you decrease the salinity here. Incompatibility between formation water and injection water. So again, looking at pure compatibility, and I've talked through that a bit already. So I've talked about scaling, so prediction with a computer, jar testing, dynamic tube block testing, core flooding, and then injecting like doing long-term injection tests into the core and observing its reaction. These are typical ways to look at that. Mixing of injection waters. Um, that's again done through scaling studies and then looking at injection at different ratios like that data set I showed you. You can do that on separate core samples and see how the result is different. That's a very common one. And we've actually designed a special header recently, a, a system for our injection to allow us to mix inside the core rather than outside the core, which can create artifacts solids and oil blocking pores, what's the filtration that's required? So take real reservoir core, very important here, and then inject particles at different filtration levels, either through a cartridge filter or through a, a, a or with the, the distribution pre-made in the rock and looking at what impact that has on the rock. You may find out good news, any filtration level is good for my reservoir, or you may find, oh, hang on, we need fine filtration to not damage this reservoir, but I'd rather find that out on a bit of rock than on a well that, I, that I'm trying to drill, or injection, I see. Water injection into oil leg, looking at organic precipitates, you know, wax, do we have waxing? This is, we've looked at this a few times in the North Sea, for example. Water injection into an oil leg, simulate that by taking a hot reservoir and injecting cold injection water into it, seeing if wax develops, seeing if that impacts the permeability of the reservoir. Then last up, microbial damage. You know, firstly, do we have it as an issue? So that's looking at things like jar tests, bacterial inoculation tests, core flooding as well. And is there an issue? And if there is, is there a biocide? I've got another question from Uger here about uh, acidizing. So that's a good point. This is something I haven't talked about. You know, uh, can we comment on the, the effect of acidizing? Some companies do it regularly. Can we say the low pH at the time of injection may completely clean the scaling and other permeability reduction effects? I'm going to say again, maybe, because if, if, we, if we're doing an acid job and we have carbonate scale, we would absolutely expect the acid job to basically act as a stimulation treatment on that. If we have barite scale and a traditional acid, that's not going to touch it at all. We're going to need a chelating agent, for example, to, or, or a specialist fluid to scale dissolver to remove the barite. The flip side of the acid treatment, and this is one, one thing that I'm going to touch on in my last slide, which is the next one, is let's make sure that what we try in the reservoir actually works. Because an acid might remove some of the solids, it might remove the drilling damage, for example, it might remove some of the scale or precipitate damage, it might remove some salts, but then also might impact on the clays, because I said that low pH levels can actually cause clays to mobilize within the reservoir. So we have to make sure that if we're testing a fluid, that it actually doesn't hurt our reservoir. But yeah, regular, if we have the right mechanisms to respond to acidizing then absolutely that's something to do in in um in uh, injection wells and depending on the type of rock then it might you know if we're talking about clastic sandstone reservoirs and they remove damage and then of course in carbonate reservoirs we're looking at stimulation uh, treatment there as well Uger. so that's my final thoughts and you've tied into that very nicely so just before i finish off and if there's any questions we can pause um Ejectors can be much more complex than producers in terms of damage. So we need to consider that. You know, let's not just copy and paste our thoughts for how we're drilling our producers to, well, we need to do it slightly differently because it's an injector. We need to think about all this additional complication. We need to consider the drilling completion, how that can impact on the injector and the specifications of the water. 
uh, as I've mentioned, I think it's really important. I can't emphasize this enough. Good water in one formation or well may be bad in another. Just because you had successful injection in an adjacent well, adjacent field, if there's variation in the permeability, the pore throat size, the geology of the reservoir, I would be thinking it's a high risk just to chuck that water in there without having a look at it. Another thing we need to uh, we need to admit is you need to look at aspects separately and together. We don't just chuck injection water and say tick that passes or that fails. We want to know why it passes or why it fails. So, do we look at the rate? Do we look at the filtration? Do we look at the compatibility separately? I think best practice is to look at them separately. So the final question is, you know, how do we avoid these issues? So. And as I've been trying to touch upon throughout, we need to understand our specific reservoir and conditions because scaling is going to be very related to temperature, pressure and chemistry. And we can't be general about that. We have to be specific. Likewise with clay finds migration, likewise with solids and filtration. So we need to be as specific as possible. And from a lab guy like me, of course, I'm going to say, I've been saying it throughout, let's study that if we can, if there's rock, if there's time, Let's look at that. Look at what might happen in our real reservoir or has happened. If we've seen a problem in the field, let's go back and look at what happened by simulating the history. And if we find out what's caused it, because, you know, Uger's question I, I talked about on the last slide, you know, does acidizing work? It works if the right things are there. So I want to identify what things are there before I say whether the acidizing is going to work, because that opens up the solutions to me. And that's just my last comment there. Just because something has worked elsewhere or should work here, doesn't mean it necessarily will because there may be complications, there may be different mechanisms, and there may be variations in the rock and reservoir and fluid itself, which could complicate matters, which could, could cause side effects. So that was really, as I said, I wasn't going to dive really deep into everything, but hopefully what I've covered today is an overview of some of the differences that we see in injectors, why it can be complicated, and what we have to think about. And obviously scaling will be something maybe we do in a future webinar to dive deep into that, to look at you know how we look at that and how you look at inhibitors. But for today, my aim was to look at how we examine it and what kind of different mechanisms they are. So I've answered a few questions throughout. One question I, I, I realized I had a question, we got a question before we started. So if anyone has any questions now, we've got a few minutes, uh, fire away with any questions. If you don't have any questions, we'll, we'll stop it. I've just got one question I got from uh, Ian Cameron but, uh, before this started and his, his question, which I should have addressed in the uh, drilling and completion section, but is very relevant to what I was talking about um, at the end here was, how problematic is polymer damage when evaluating water-based mud and breaker performance? And is that a, a, a sort of containment on the drilling fluid design and QA, QC? Now, I'm going to answer with my first one word answer, which everyone hates, which is maybe, but no, it's a really relevant question. Um, absolutely, uh, polymer damage can be problematic. Now, if and uh, when we're evaluating the drilling mud and the the when we look back at the data set I showed earlier on with the, the injector wells for that field, some of that damage would undoubtedly have been from polymer. And the, and the aim is, well, question one is during injection, does the polymer disperse or get injected in and away to the reservoir and not cause damage? Or is it causing damage in, in the neo well bore? And does a breaker or an enzyme help break that down and remove it? So yes, absolutely. We have and do see polymer damage. Ian, if you're on this, I don't know if you are on the, on the webinar, but we can and do see polymer damage. And it just does tie back to my, my comments I always say is let's see if it actually does damage at these temperature conditions, these reservoir conditions, these overbalances, these types of drilling mud cakes. And absolutely, this one of the key things that we're asked to look at in these kind of studies, and it absolutely can be a significant damage, not just in drilling, we can see polymer damage in suspension pills and in completion fluids and in kill pills and in frac fluids as well. The polymer can cause damage. So the, the polymer damage absolutely is something we see quite a lot. So I hope if you're on you and you heard that and that answered your question. I just don't see any open questions just now. So maybe give it a, set, a minute more for any open oh, question here from Uger. Uger's just saying thank you very much. That's good. Um, Uger, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, uh, you'll all, he's asking about the, the recording. Um, so what we'll do is when this finishes this pr the uh, tomorrow probably you'll get a link to watch this video again and what we we're looking at uploading this to our YouTube channel so we'll either have this entire presentation or more likely we'll have an edited highlights a short version of this presentation um, so Ahmed is asking produce water which contains H2S shall we use it in the lab core flood or should we treat it before injection <laughs> yeah in produce water with H2S. So I th actually, I think there, there, there's lots of interesting questions there, Ahmed. 
which is um, should we treat it before injection? You should treat it before injection if it's going to have a negative impact on the reservoir. If it's not, if we're going to safely inject it, then you can potentially remove remove that that difficulty of injecting it, and then avoid the the facilities or the handling of H two S at surface. But will it impact the reservoir? Good question. That's when I'd be wanting to think about what happens with my actual rock and my actual reservoir. You know, H two S chemically that has that 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 changes the chemistry of the injection water, changes the pH of the injection water. So when I knew if I knew I had H two S in my injection water, I'd be thinking about things like scaling and compatibility with the reservoir. So I'd want, I think the easiest and nicest answer is no, you don't want to remove it, but I want to make sure that didn't hurt the reservoir first. Um, so that's a great question, which I didn't touch upon, but produced water, I was talking about solids and oil, but yeah, entrained gases are something you absolutely should be considering, Ahmed. So we have a, another question from Ruger here, a similar question. Do you think using synthetic formation brine or brine taken directly from the well affect the core flooding results? So I'm going to answer that specifically on formation brine, because for injection water, we can fairly readily make brine of this, exactly the same chemistry. And it's actually quite easy if we want to, to get injection water. And as long as it's not aged, we can just, if we get it straight from well site, we can even do these core floods at well site. If we can't do them at well site, we can also stabilize them and send them, send them to the field, uh, send them to the lab. Uh, with formation brine, um, there are some additional concerns in it because unless you're using a pressurized formation brine sample and doing live core flooding, which not many people, if anybody does, for this type of core flooding, then you're going to have a surface sample of formation brine, which has been depressurized and which can age. And the two things you tend to see Uger, in um, formation brines fairly quickly is they start to age in two ways. You start to see um, uh, bacteria develop and you can also see um, iron dropping out because obviously it's surface conditions. If there's any iron in the formation brine, you start to see your waters going orange with time. And that means that the water is less representative because you're taking away. So you could say you could add a bit of biocide in it, but then that changes the chemistry of the formation brine. And you could say, well, I just will filter the iron out. But then the, the, if you do two or three core floods a week apart, then you can have a different chemistry of formation brine. So we tend to um, do core floods for injectors using lab brines, using this, so doing an analysis on the brine sample from the field straight away when it hasn't aged, and then recreating that in the lab, you know, typically emitting iron from it, the formation, and we don't have to worry about bacteria with a lab formation. So you, we typically would use synthetic formation brines and core floods, and I don't believe that has a strong, if any, impact on test results. As long as you make it properly to the same formulation, you've got a good brine analysis, which is representative and double-checked, then synthetic brines don't tend to be an issue in this type of core flooding. I think that was oh, I think that was the last question. So just give it one second more for any any further questions. My email address is up here on the screen. So if anyone has any further questions, I'm always happy to take take questions. If you have anything you want to touch upon, and as I think Jennifer is going to touch upon when she wraps up in in a second, uh, we're always happy to talk to individual operators, individual companies. If you would, if there's something sp specific you'd like us to talk about. Drop, drop a line to us because we're always happy to run a little webinar for a specific team who have a specific thing of interest. Um, it's a good way of keeping in touch and getting to know you guys. So if there's anything you'd specifically like to talk about, just ask us to do it. So maybe that's something uh, Jennifer would like to talk about because we don't have any more questions. Maybe that's Jennifer would like to wrap up and talk about what we're finishing off with. Perfect. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been great to have you with us today. Yeah, as Justin said, any further questions, just contact us directly. We'll be happy to answer, up, answer any follow-up follow queries. Um, we will also be sending out the link to the webinar recording tomorrow in a follow-up email, so you can visit the slides then if you would like. Justin also touched on our webinars, um, technical feature videos that will be coming soon on our Premier Oilfield Group and Premier Corex YouTube channels. There is some great content up there already, actually. So if you're interested, please take a look. And if you subscribe to the channel, that means you'll be able to keep getting updated on more of our content that we'll be releasing in the coming weeks. Look out for Justin. He'll be back on the 25th of June with our or the next in our formation damage topics, looking at improved sanding assessment and sand control. So he'll be taking a look at how we can increase our understanding of the potential impact of sanding.
why choosing the best sand control hardware is important and how a more integrated approach to sand control selection can allow better decisions to be made. We will also be back again a bit sooner on the 18th of June with the next core analysis and EOR session from our global technical manager, Jules Reed, titled Wettability, Essential but Meaningless. Um, and here Jules will take a look at some of our basic wettability controls, how it's changed, what can go wrong, and look at the current wettability measurement methods um, and those that are needed to ensure representative core data. So please keep an eye on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter pages for more, more information and you'll be able to see the registration details for everything on there shortly as they're posted. Justin touched on again in his um, session, we'll always be willing to host focus sessions for you and your team. So anything specific you'd like to see from us, just let us know. Or if even any of your colleagues have missed the session today, for example, be happy to rerun it for you and maybe look in a bit more detail at any specific requirements or issues you might have. So feel free just to get in touch if that's something of interest to you. So I think that's all from us today, but many thanks again for joining us and we will hope to see you next time. Thanks everyone.